open our hearts and to heaven and just honor him tonight. Press into his presence. Surrender our hearts and wills. We honor you, Father. We magnify you. We glorify you. We rejoice in you, the God of our salvation. There's none like you in all of the earth. Be glorified in our midst. Be lifted up as we magnify your holy name on high. As together we lift up our voices before your throne. Join the heavenly host declaring you are a holy, holy, holy God. Deserving of all the praise and honor that we can possibly give you. For who you are, for all that you've done for us in Christ. Hallelujah to the Lamb that was slain. Let him hear your voice of praise tonight. Let him hear you declare his goodness. Lord, you are good. Your mercies endure forever. You are great and greatly to be praised. There's none like you in all the earth. Our hearts thirst after you is in a dry and thirsty land where no water is give you all the glory that you deserve, to see your power, your glory, as you manifest your presence among us. Blessing and honor and glory and power be to him who sits on the throne of the Lamb forever. Hallelujah. Praise God. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Jesus.
Thank you, Father, for your presence among us this evening. We reverence your presence, hold you in the highest esteem and regard. We lift you up in this place. We're here for you, to love on you, to bless you, to magnify, glorify you, to learn from you by your Holy Spirit as you change us from glory to glory. Thank you, Jesus, for the sacrifice that you made for each and every one of us, the shedding of your blood, you becoming the curse on Calvary, bearing our sin, sickness, and carrying our pains, that we might be delivered, set free, and made whole, spiritually, emotionally, physically, and in every way. We thank you, precious Holy Spirit, for your presence here among us, knowing this is your dispensation, and we know that you're moving on the earth in a powerful and glorious way, carrying out the Father's plan and the works of Jesus to make it a reality in each and every life, and everyone that comes to you, come to know you intimately and personally. In this place, you are high and lifted up. In this place, you are exalted among us. In this place, our focus and attention is on you and you alone. We're here to please you and you alone. Hallelujah. Be glorified in our midst. Be magnified in our midst as we rejoice in you, the God of glory and the God of our salvation. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you for your saving grace. Thank you for your healing grace. Thank you for your delivering grace. Thank you, hallelujah, for access by faith into this grace wherein we stand. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's continue ministering unto the Lord here, just loving on him and honoring him. Hallelujah. You are so worthy, Lord, so worthy of honor, so worthy of glory, so worthy of praise and power. For there's none like you in all of the earth. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Hallelujah to the King of glory. You said, whoso offers praise glorifies me. And he that will order his conversation aright will I show my saving strength. So we set our love upon you. You said you'd deliver us. You'd set us on high because we know your name. When he call upon you, you would answer us and be with us in trouble and deliver us and honor us. And with long, long life, you would satisfy us and show us your great and glorious salvation. For there is none like you in all of the earth. You are glorious in holiness, fearful in praises, doing wonders among the people. You are the mighty one of Israel. You are the most high God, the El Shaddai of our lives. You are the God of plenty. You're more than enough. Jesus, Emmanuel, Son of God, Son of righteousness, arisen with healing in your wings. We exalt your name on high, the only name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved, healed, delivered, set free, and made whole. Thank God for the mighty name of Jesus. As your ambassadors, we are here to represent you well upon the earth, to carry out our life mission, to fulfill the purpose of your will. And Father, we know your will is to save the lost, heal the sick, and set the captives free. And so we're here as your ambassadors to proclaim the truth with power 
and might. Stretch forth your hand to heal. May signs and wonders be wrought by the name of thy holy child, Jesus, as we honor you in this place. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise God. As we're in this atmosphere, if you're out there and you need prayer, I want to anoint you with oil tonight. Praise God. Feel free to come. Thank you, Jesus. Feel free to come. Hallelujah. Praise God. Anyone else feel free to come up? Casting out fear. You are the God of all power, and it is your will that my life is healed. Sickness can stay any longer. Your perfect love is casting out fear. You are the God of all power, and it is your will that my life is healed. Healing is near. Thank you, Jesus. Healing is near. Healing is near. I receive it.
everywhere that Jesus went, we are told in Matthew 14, 14, he saw the sick and was moved with compassion and healed all that were sick. And I don't believe he's any less passionate today than he was then. I believe he's just as passionate today as he was then and still the healer today. And so we thank him and praise him for what he did on Calvary to take care of our sin, sickness, and disease and becoming the curse for us. And thank God there's a healer in the house today. Aren't you glad for the healer in the house today? Thank you, thank you, Jesus. Amen, amen. Well, you may be seated if you can. Praise God, we welcome each of you this evening. We thank the Lord for your lives by live streaming and also here in house. We thank God that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, forever, and always, and will never change. Aren't you glad for that? So when you see the Jesus of the Bible, we know he's just exactly today as he was when he walked on the earth. And read through the Gospels and you find out that healing was a major part of his ministry, a major part of his ministry. And of course, it was continued in the book of Acts by his disciples and the apostles as they went forth and did the same works that he did. And there's no reason to believe that it's ever stopped. He's still the same today. Amen? And I know we can attest to that. So many of us have been already healed by the power of God. Uh, just a reminder on Friday, 10 to 12, I believe it is. Is it this Friday? Do we have um, food or not? Not this week? Read the bulletin, I guess. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Praise God. It's a privilege and an honor to worship our Heavenly Father with the giving of our tithes and offerings. So if you need an envelope, just kindly raise your hand. We'd like to get one to you. Give out of a heart of faith and love. Give because you love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and also because you have a desire for the lost to be saved, compassion for lost humanity, to advance the kingdom of God in the earth. Those are the reasons why we give. Amen. And if we do our part, God will do his part. Nothing better than to support the work of God upon the earth, the salvation of the lost, the healing of the sick, and setting of the captives free. Everybody prepared? Let's pray. Father, it's an honor to be able to fund your kingdom upon the earth. It's an honor to support your work so that you may continue to fulfill all that you desire to be done here upon the earth through human vessels such as ours. We thank you, dear Father God, for bringing us from the realms of darkness into the light of your kingdom, where we can serve you faithfully and walk with you throughout life. It is an honor for us to support your work, and as we give this evening, we give that the lost will continue to be saved. Hallelujah. The sick healed, the bound and afflicted set free, the needs of people being met, relationships being restored, and Father, Everything that you so desire on this earth among men as Jesus, when he walked upon the earth and did, our desire is to continue it. And we believe to receive the blessing of the tither and the benefit of the giver, that we may continue to support your work, to give as you divinely lead us and direct us by your spirit, that you would be glorified in the earth, that the church would be edified and built up, and lost humanity would come to your saving grace. Be glorified in our giving tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Just go ahead and place your offering in the basket, if you would, and honor the Lord your God. I reach my hand to the heaven, lift my eyes where my help comes from, I look to you, my rock, my healer, I sing. I see you. 
God for Jesus, our healer. Jesus, the healer. Praise God. Tonight we're talking about the ministry of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit and his gifts. This is his dispensation. You know, all three of the Godhead are involved in our redemption. God the Father planned it. Jesus worked it. And the Holy Ghost makes it a reality in people's lives. Aren't you glad that the Spirit of God hovered over your life one day and brought conviction to you of sin, righteousness, and judgment? Anybody glad for that? I remember as a young person just having this conviction upon me, but I didn't know what to do with it. It was probably years before I really understood what it was. It was conviction, but it was the Holy Spirit who Jesus said would come and convict you of sin, righteousness, and judgment, those three things. And thank God, I'm glad that he never gave up on me. Because a few times I kind of rejected that. I had no idea what was going on. You know, you could be in church and not be saved. Did you know that? You could sit in a chicken coop and not be a chicken. For 25 years, if you like, right? You could sit in a garage and not be a car either. Right? I sat in church for 24 years. I wasn't saved. I wasn't born again. But I was in church. You know, going to church and you're not saved kind of makes you wonder why were you even doing it? You know, when I got saved... I, I'll be honest with you. When I was in church and not saved, I hated it. When I got saved, you couldn't keep me out of church. Amen. See the difference? Yeah. You got on the inside. When it's on the inside, praise God, you're going to want it. Let's pray. Father, tonight we thank you for the privilege of studying your word together. We study it in the precious name of Jesus. Give us ears to hear it, hearts to receive it, minds that are open to it. Anoint my lips to clay to proclaim truth with power and demonstration and make them as a pen of a ready writer to proclaim truth, dear Father God, to all that hear. Change us by what we hear from glory to glory, and we'll be certain to give you all the praise, honor, and glory that you deserve for all things in Jesus' name. Amen. We're talking about the Holy Spirit and His gifts. This is our fourth lesson. Uh, we've been talking about the fact that there are nine gifts of the Spirit. The Spirit world's a real world. You know that. And there are nine manifestations of the Spirit that we have to be familiar with, and really God wants us to operate in. And those, three, uh, those nine gifts are manifested in three different groups. Uh, we talked about... The revelation gifts, which are the word of knowledge, the word of wisdom, discerning of spirits. And there's also the power gifts. The power gifts are special faith, gifts of healing and working in miracles. And then you've got the vocal gifts. The vocal gifts are prophecy, tongues, interpretation of tongues. So those nine gifts are gifts of the spirit for the church today to, uh, to walk in and to experience. Well, the word of knowledge we talked about deals with the past and the present where there is a divine revelation given to somebody in a word form, not the whole thing, but a word, a word of knowledge. That's what it's talking about, a word of knowledge. It could be just one word. It could be a couple of words, but it's not the whole sentence. It's not the whole picture. It's not the whole plan. It just may be a word. Once I was told the word bitterness and that bitterness, that word bitterness resulted in someone having a creative miracle in their life when they did something about the bitterness. Another situation, there was a woman that was, uh, had a back situation and she was healed just through a word of knowledge. A word of wisdom is about the future. It predicts or it tells you something about the future that will take place. And thank God I can think of a better gift than that when you know what's going to happen before it happens. When Jehoshaphat was uh, facing three armies that were coming to wipe them off the planet, he was told exactly where to go the next day where the enemy would be, where they could set up an ambush for them and overcome. And so that's good to know that, isn't it? In other cases, there was, for example, there's going to be a drought for the next two years that was revealed so they could prepare for that. And so there are reasons for these manifestations of the Spirit. God gives them to us for a specific reason. Tonight we're going to talk about what is called the discerning of spirits. And we see this in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 8 through 10. We'll read that. For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge by the same Spirit, to another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, the gifts of healings by the same Spirit. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, discerning of spirits. Now notice the wording. Discerning of spirits. To another, diverse kinds of tongues. To another, the interpretation of tongues. So here we have these nine gifts revealed to us. But when it comes to the discerning of spirits, it seems like as though that many think that we're talking about discernment. That's not what that gift is. It's called discerning of spirits. That's the name of the gift. So discernment, you could say maybe that 
is something that someone possesses, maybe an ability, let's say, to perceive something about a person's character or something like that. You've heard people say that they're very discerning about things. And that's fine. That's wonderful. But all these gifts are supernatural. Not natural, but supernatural. Where God, by His Spirit, gives a revelation of something. And we'll get to that and what it is in a moment. So it's not natural discernment. And also, it's not the power to discover the faults of another person. You know, don't, you don't want to pray, God, give me this gift so I can find out everybody else's faults. I don't think you'd want to do that. Look at the, I'll tell you why. Look at Luke's Gospel in chapter 6. This is from the Message Bible. I read that, and you know, it'll really do a number on you. It's easy to see a smudge on your neighbor's face. Did you notice that? You know, sometimes if I leave a little something over there when I'm taking a bite to eat something, Andrew will say, are you saving that for later? He's a character. It's easy to find out someone else's smudge on their face, right? And be oblivious to the ugly sneer on your own. Wow, pretty graphic. Do you have the nerve to say, let me wash your face for you when your own face is distorted by contempt? It's this I know better than you mentality again, playing a holier than thou part instead of just living your own part. Wipe that ugly sneer off your own face and you might be fit to offer a washcloth to your neighbor. Oh, does that hurt? Ouch. Think about that statement. Really, if that really was a gift that people think they would have, you turn that gift on yourself one time, look in the mirror, and you'll find out so many faults that are there, you probably would never want to use it again on anybody else, is what he's really saying. It's so easy to get caught up in pride and, and that sort of thing and think that, oh, I do everything right. It's everybody else who's wrong. Well, this gift is not discernment, okay? It's also not ESP. It's not mental penetration. It's not spiritual mind reading. It's not suspicion. It's not being keenly perceptive or contacting even spirits of the dead. It's not anything like that. But once again, people get involved in these things. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 18. It's not necromancy. Necromancy is um, the practice of uh, communicating with spirits of the dead. And that's not what we're supposed to do. Look at what it says in Deuteronomy chapter 18. When thou art come into the land which the Lord your God gives you, thou shalt not learn to do after the abominations of those nations. There shall not be found among you any one that makes his son or his daughter to pass through the fire, or that uses divination, or an observer of times, or an enchanter, or a witch, or a charmer, or a consulter with familiar spirits, or a wizard, or a necromancer. For all that do these things are an abomination unto the Lord, and because of these abominations, the Lord shall, thy God doth drive them out from before thee. Thou shalt be perfect with the Lord thy God. For these nations which thou shalt possess, hearken unto observers of times, and unto diviners. Uh, but as for thee, the Lord thy God hath not suffered thee so to do. So necromancy is uh, conjuring up the spirits of those that have departed. And this is so important because you see te television shows like psychics that are on, and you go down the highway, you see card reading and, you know, all that sort of thing. You know, all that stuff is demonic. All that stuff is being involved in witchcraft, sorcery, and all those things that the Bible clearly states that we should not ever be a part of anything like that. Someone I know once said, but, but you don't understand. They told me exactly uh, what I needed to know and that and this, that, and the other thing. But you know what? You know where they're getting their information from? Familiar spirits. Not the Holy Spirit, not the right spirit. And that can happen because there are spirits that are familiar with other people. The spirit world is a real world that's out there. It's a real realm, okay? And so it's important we understand the nature of it and understand how we are to invoke the presence of the living God, not a wrong spirit. So the practice is an abomination to the Lord, and it exposes a person to a familiar spirit, and you don't want to get involved in a familiar spirit. I'll tell you what, there are those that just don't want to give it up. Do you remember the story of the book of Acts where the apostle Paul has this woman following her who was really making profit for her people that followed her through soothsaying? And she kept on just saying, you know, these are the men of God. They're showing us the way of salvation. She did this for days, and finally Paul got probably a revelation. It could have been discerning of spirits where he saw a spirit that was behind what she was doing or actually saw the spirit. He rebuked the spirit. The spirit left. And guess what? She couldn't do it anymore. 
And when she couldn't do it anymore, they were upset with her because they lost, you know, their ability, let's say, to succeed. That's where they were getting their information from. So is it legitimate? Yeah, you could look beyond this world at that spiritual realm as well. But you know what? I guarantee you, he's baiting you. Yeah. Going to destroy you with it. That's what it's all about. That's the game he plays. I remember um, John G. Lake. Have you ever studied under John G. Lake, anyone? John G. Lake was just a, an amazing uh, apostle of faith. And I remember reading after him, and he was talking about, well, let me back up first for a minute. He was someone who was very intelligent, very involved in uh, all kinds of practices as far as medical practices. He was, uh, he was also involved in uh, law. He was involved in different things. But he also liked putting together, um, let's see, uh, Mm, so sometimes what he would do is go to his friends that he knew in the, in the medical field and say, I want you to hook me up. I want you to hook my brain up to take some, run some tests about my brain function, how it works. He did all that just to come up with uh, ideas as to how God, when he takes over a person's life by his spirit, manifests himself in a powerful way through a person's life. And so he did all these different testings and all that. Well, one day he was probably in some city somewhere, just driving down the road, and he saw tarot card reading. And so the explorer that he was, he said, this is wonderful. So he stops, gets out, and he walks in, walks up to the person, and just says, in the name of Jesus, I rebuke you, foul spirit, behind this activity. The person said, you can't do that. You can't stop me from doing what I'm doing, he said, try it now. Spirit was gone, and she was at a loss. There is a real activity of evil spirits out there, and sometimes we don't recognize that and realize that, and what happens is they gain control over people's lives. But he knew it was a spirit of divination behind all that activity, and some things that were being said were true, but you know what? When a person dies... The Bible does not say that they have a, they're allowed to leave where they're at. If you're in hell, you're in hell. If you're in heaven, you're in heaven. Anything other than that, you've got a familiar spirit that you're dealing with. Someone says, but I you know, had this conjured up. No, stay away from that. You don't want any part of that. What it really is is a supernatural insight into the realm of spirits. Notice this, the, the discerning of spirits. To discern really means to look into or, or see or hear in that realm. Notice, see or hear in that realm. That's what it really is. It's not just perception, but it's actually seeing in that realm of spirits. And we'll give you a lot of examples here in just a moment. But it deals with an entire class of spirit beings. It could be good spirits, evil spirits. It could be the spirit of Christ. It could be the similitude of God. It could be angels, angelic spirits. It could be demonic spirits, human spirits, and so on. But it's actually entering into that realm where you can actually see beyond this world. It's almost as if God just removes the veil, takes the curtain away, and you can see into that realm of the spirit, discerning of spirits, seeing and hearing in the spirit realm. And that is a gift of the spirit. And really, it, it has a function in the body of Christ, and a powerful function and a good function. So it's more than just even getting a revelation of, well, there's a demonic spirit that's involved in this situation. You may have a word of knowledge that tells you that, but it goes beyond that. It actually shows it to you. You can actually see it. In one of the books that I have in my studies, uh, this one individual actually painted a picture of a woman who was a teacher who was demon-possessed. As the Spirit of God opened up his eyes to see that, and you should, you should see what some of these things look like. It's just beyond your comprehension. Um, when we get to the demonic influences and all that, there's, there's uh, some things that you might shy away from. You don't want to be a part of if God were to show you something like that. But we'll get to that in just a moment. Some biblical examples include, look at the book of Exodus, chapter 33. And this is something that Moses desired so much. Moses speaking to God said, Thou canst, or God says to Moses, Thou canst see my face, for there shall no man see me and live. And the Lord said, Behold, there is a place by me, and thou shalt stand upon a rock, and it shall come to pass, while my glory passes by, then I will put thee in the cliff of the rock, 
and will cover thee with my hand while I pass by. And I will take away my hand, and thou shalt see, notice the word see, see my back parts, but my face shall not be seen. Why? You see his face, you're going to die. But notice he said, you can see my back parts. So Moses was privileged to be able to see the similitude of God, to see his back parts, because he took him into that realm of the spirit. That's called discerning of spirits, looking beyond this realm into that realm of spirits. And that was his longing desire, and, and God honored it. Look at Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 1, what it says. You, you should be familiar with this verse. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Notice he said, I saw. So once again, this is not discernment, but discerning to see into this realm. You get a vision of it. God, or for example, takes you up like he did and you can see before the throne. Now, he couldn't look into his face, obviously, he would die. Or whatever he did to prevent that from happening, God would do. But he actually saw him high and lifted up and full of glory. Can you imagine if that was ever answered in your life, if you had that longing desire to be to that place where you can actually see him on his throne high and lifted up and watch these angels. He also, if you read the rest of it, angels were there. He saw the activity of these angels crying out, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. You want to talk about dealing with someone's character and attitude and that sort of thing and, and whether it's right living, wrong living and everything, let him have a visit there at the throne for a while. Let, the, let him watch those angels bowing before the throne and see the holiness of God. I'll tell you what, it'll absolutely change a person's life. Then look at Luke's gospel, I'm sorry, Matthew's gospel, chapter 17. Here we have another example of what is called the discerning of spirits. It's not discernment, knowing about somebody's character. After six days, Jesus takes Peter, James, and John, his brother, and brings them up into the high mountain apart and was transfigured before them. And his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment white was white as the light. And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elias talking with him. Then answered Peter and said unto Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If thou wilt, let us make here three tabernacles, one for thee, one for Moses, and one for Elias or Elijah, while he had spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice out of the cloud which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their face, and they were sore afraid. And Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise, and be not afraid. And when they had lifted up their eyes, they saw no man save Jesus. And as they came down from the mountain, Jesus charged them, tell, saying, Tell the vision to no man until the Son of Man be risen again from the dead. So notice in this section of Scripture, what we have is what is called the transfiguration. He sees these individuals. Now, this was a special manifestation of the discerning of spirits that God allowed to happen or willed by His Spirit to impact their lives. Would that impact your life? If you saw Jesus, Moses, and Elijah like that, would that impact your life? Would that make you think just for a moment? Absolutely. Absolutely. But once again, this is an activity of the work of the Spirit of Almighty God when, as He wills, will open up a person's eyes to the spiritual realm that you can see and that you can hear. And He saw and He heard. And so that is another manifestation of this gift. Look in Luke's Gospel, chapter 1. We have another revelation of it, or another example of it. And there appeared unto him, this is Zacharias, an angel of the Lord, standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zacharias saw him, notice he saw him, he was troubled and fear fell upon him. But the angel said unto him, Fear not, Zacharias, for thy prayer is heard, and thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call his name John. Well, that's what he saw. He saw, he was ministering in the temple like he should, and he saw what? An angel, this was Gabriel the angel, who gives him a message. He heard the message. He told him exactly what's going to happen. Your wife is going to have a child. All these years we've heard your prayer, and now you know what? You're going to have a son, but his name's going to be John. Well, you know the story. What does Zacharias do? Imagine that. In that setting, in that atmosphere, right there in the temple, and he sees the angel, he goes, how can this be? She's old. I'm old. Basically, he was full of doubt and unbelief, even though he was in that office of the of priest. 
And so what happens? Gabriel says, <laughs> he got his dander up a little bit. I came from the presence of the Most High God to deliver you a message. Now, because you don't believe, you'll be struck dumb and you won't be able to speak until it come to pass. We don't need you interfering with the work of God. My paraphrase. Can you imagine that? Wow. See, sometimes we pray for our loved ones to come to Christ or come back to the Lord or whatever. What we should be praying for is that there would be a godly reverential fear imparted to their innermost being. And if that means an angel appears to them to achieve that, then so be it. So we see this happening, and of course, he blows it. But look at this next one. This one, in John, uh, Luke's also 126, let's start with that. We have the same angel. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God into, unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph, of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail, thou, art, thou that art highly favored, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying. And cast her in mind what manner of salutation this should be. And the angel said to her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. He shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. They're seeing and hearing. She sees the angel. She hears the angel. And you know the story, the rest of that story is, and unlike Zechariah, she said, Well, then be it unto me according to the word of God. So we see people have different responses when it comes to situations like this. But once again, this is discerning of spirits. She saw an angel. She heard the angel. So she was ushered to that realm of the spirit. And it resulted in something really powerful. John chapter 20, look at this one. Begin at verse 11. But Mary stood without the sepulcher, weeping as, as she wept. She stooped down and looked into the sepulcher. And seeth two angels in white sitting, the one at the head, the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. And they say unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? She saith unto them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I know not where they have laid him. And when she had thus said, she turned herself back and saw Jesus standing, and really knew not that it was Jesus. But the point is, here's dialogue that's taking place. Here we got, again, a, a, a woman seeing Two angels talking to the angels, the angels talking to her, and then she sees Jesus, and that story goes on as well. So you're getting a picture painted of this gift. The discerning of spirits is God opening up our spiritual eyes so that we could see beyond the natural world into the realm of the spirits and identify angels, angelic beings, and even demonic in, in spirit, spirits as well. Look at another one in Acts chapter 1. Here we have the same thing happening. When he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, and with, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? The same Jesus which is taken up from you into heaven shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. Now, if those words are true, and they have to be because they were spoken by these angelic beings, is they watched him ascend on high to the throne is the way he's coming back for us, his people, and then to set up his kingdom here upon the earth in his second coming. But notice they just saw this. They saw it happening. What a sight to behold. We think we know something here on this earth. You talk about that kind of travel. You know what Andrew constantly says to me? Hey, Dad, I know, how about this one? This is really good. I know you're getting older, but don't, don't be concerned about dying because when you die, you're going to go straight to heaven to be a second. I said, thanks, son. Appreciate that. He said, it's like that, that fast. I know, I, it's happened. I know. Uh, okay. All right, Drew. Appreciate that very much. Revelation chapter 1. I'm, I have these verses here because these just absolutely... Fire me up when I read this. Okay, so let's look at these verses in Revelation chapter 1. 
I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice of a trumpet, saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. And what thou seest, write in a book and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus and Smyrna and Pergamos and to Thyatira and Sardis and Philadelphia and to Laodicea. And I turned to see the voice that spoke with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks, and in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, girt about the paps with a golden girdle. His hand was, and his hairs were like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire, his feet like in the fine brass, as if burned, they burn in a furnace, and his voice was the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars out of his mouth, one a sharp two-edged sword. His countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am the, he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I'm alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of hell and death. Hallelujah. Can you imagine just minding your own business walking down the street and you hear a voice behind you? I am Alpha and Omega. I'm the beginning and the end. I'm the first and the last. I was dead. I'm alive forevermore. I've got the keys. Whoo, glory to God. Wow. Stepping out of this realm, you're stepping into that realm, and that's what we see. John caught up and saw all these things in Revelation. I love Revelation chapter 5. It's one of my favorite chapters in the Bible. I saw on the right hand of him a book written within on the backside, sealed with seven seals. And I heard a strong angel with a loud voice saying, Who's worthy to take the book and loose the seals thereof? Nobody in heaven, earth, or beneath the earth was found worthy to take the book and loose the seals thereof. And so I went much. But one of the elders said to me, Weep not, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, he has prevailed to take the book and loose the seals thereof. And I beheld in the midst of the throne was the lamb as he had been slain, having seven eyes, seven horns, which are the seven spirits that God set forth in the, all the earth. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. And when he took the book, the beast, the, uh, the, the elders fell down before the lamb, having seven, having, sorry, seven harps, golden vials, full of voters, which are the prayers of saints. And they sung a new song saying, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive blessing and honor and glory and power. And I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne, and the number was in 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb. Riches, wisdom, strength, honor, glory, and blessing. Every creature in heaven and earth and beneath the earth, such as are in the sea, heard I saying. He was hearing in the spiritual world, such as in the sea, Anybody that died, lost their life, such as in the sea, heaven, earth, beneath the earth, in the sea, worthy is the Lamb to receive blessing and honor and glory and power. Wow. That's what this gift is all about, that you step out of this realm into that realm, and God gives you a glimpse of heaven, a glimpse of the spiritual world. All that was taking place, and he witnessed it. He saw all that. Pretty powerful, wouldn't you say? But what about us? Let's get down to brass tacks. What about us? Well, Pastor Goodwin, who pastored the First Assembly of God Church in uh, Glidewater, Texas, he had a situation where the church that he was pastoring was a Assembly of God Church, but um, it was tough sledding, if you know what I mean. You're preaching, but it seems like it's just not going anywhere, not penetrating anyone just doesn't seem to be effective like it needs to be. And so he was waiting on the Lord and in the parsonage across the street, and he was just waiting on the Lord. And one day he looked out over to the church, and God opened up his eyes. He saw this gorilla-like demon in the rafters of the church that was hovering over the church. You know, these spirits want to manifest themselves in people's lives. They want to also destroy the work of God. He said, so I just walked on over. I looked up and I saw him up there in the rafters of the church. He said, I come down. He didn't want to. Come down in the name of Jesus. He came down. Started to whimper in front of him. He said, I knew better than to, you know, contend with him. He said, because remember about Moses says, just the Lord rebuked thee. I'm not going to contend with you. I'm just telling you, come down. He said, in the name of Jesus, off the property. 
He didn't want to. Whimpering. Like a little puppy dog that really wants something. He's just whimpering a little bit. Acting like sheepish. He said, out of the church. Out. Get out. So he starts to walk out. He follows them out. And he sees a, like a, a lounge somewhere down the street. He says, now get out of here and don't ever come back in here. As he walked away, he said, he turned around and looked at me and he was no longer sheepish. He said, fangs came out and this horrible look on his face was seen, thinking that he was going to frighten him and, you know, kind of back off. He said, out in the name of Jesus and never return. I guess he went down to the lounge and got robbed, and one said that it burned down or whatever, you know, too many demons, I guess. I don't know, but that was the effect of it. Then there's another situation where, see, that was a, well, after that, let me, let me back up. After that, preaching in the church was wonderful, and there was a great revival that took place as a result of that. So you see, that spirit was manifesting itself in that manner, holding that church down, keeping that church from going forward in God. Now we have Brother Hagen was talking about, this was actually a relative of his, and this person had lung cancer. And he prayed for her, I think, at different times. But at one point, he was open, his eyes were open to the spiritual realm. He said, and I saw this evil spirit clinging to the left side of her body over the left lung. And this person was this dying as a result of the cancer. He said, I rebuked it, commanded to leave the body. It left, and when that spirit left, she was completely healed. So there's another use of this gift, discerning of spirits. And in some cases, they have to be discerned or seen in that spiritual realm, um, unless a person would use their faith like they, like they can. And there was another one where, you know, you pray for somebody. He prayed for somebody here, let's say as a he in a healing line, and the person had terrible migraine headaches that he had constantly. So he prayed for him just like he would anybody else and went on down the line. And then as he turned around to look this way to go back over, he said, I saw him sitting in the pew. And while he was sitting in the pew, I saw a monkey-like demon with his arms wrapped around his head, squeezing him. He said, then I knew exactly what to do. I looked over it and I said, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus Christ. Leave his body now. He left. The guy just jumped out of his pew, man, and just said, I'm free. Now, this guy didn't see it, but Brother Hagin saw it when he saw that demon wrapped around his head. Pers person was delivered, set free, no more headaches. See, there was an evil spirit that was enforcing that in that person's life. The spiritual world is a real world. We need to understand that. And you know what? The enemy has done his best to do what? To keep churches like Pentecostal, charismatic churches down. Why? Because he doesn't want us to, to do warfare with him. He wants to have his own way with people in people's lives. In some cases, people aren't going to even get saved unless a demon spirit is dealt with in their life. Now, personally, I had some experiences along this line. Um, I've shared with you many times I saw my angel driving down Route 11. Uh, I probably saw my angels in Tulsa, Oklahoma, when uh, some people stole my, my equipment, and I asked the angels, to, I commissioned them to go forth and bring them back, and they brought them back. Knocked on my door, didn't even know who the person was, and could be entertaining uh, angels unawares. But then also, in this one time, it was really, really something, because, wow. It's one thing to hear others, it's another thing to have them yourself, you know, and I just was coming home from a Bible study up in Youngstown, and stopped someone who was on the street that was hurt, and we took some time to nurse him back to hell, God picked him up, wiped the blood off of his head, took him to his house, which was close by, gave him the gospel message after we got him cleaned up. Another brother of the Lord stopped with me and, you know, shared the gospel with him, prayed a sinner's prayer with him. And it took about 45 minutes, and, and then my son was with his mother in the car, and he was only young. He was young, maybe a year, year and a half. I don't know exactly how old he was. I don't remember the time. But he started burning up in fever while I was in there with this guy. When I came out and said, look, listen, look at him. He's just suddenly is burning up with fever. And so um, I said, okay, well, let's get home. We, just, we were downtown Midland, just went down the hill, went to our parsonage, went up to the bedroom, and uh, put him in his crib, 
took the other one, put her where she needed to be. And then I turned to walk back. I started walking back into that room, that bedroom. And it was as if I walked into a brick wall when I got halfway in. I mean, it hit me, and I stopped. It was like in a heartbeat. And at that point, immediately, I knew what to do. You know, that's the thing about spiritual things. Sometimes they're hard to describe. I knew exactly what to do. It's like when you leave this realm, you go to that realm, you're known as you are known. You will know things instantly, automatically, just like that. And I heard the voice of the Lord say to me, you've shown the love toward that person. I'm showing you my love for you. I looked over at my son, who was burning up with fever, breathing really hard. And I said, come out of him in the name of Jesus Christ. I was never going to pray that way. I was just going to walk over, lay hands on him, and thank God for his healing. I said, come out in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the moment I said that, a black bird-like figure flew off the top of his head out the window and he stopped breathing heavily instantly. The fever left instantly. That's called a spirit of infirmity. Remember the lady that had a spirit of infirmity about over 18 years, rheumatoid arthritis, and she couldn't anywise lift up herself? There was a spirit of infirmity behind that. Now, not all sickness, not all disease has a spirit in manifesting itself in a person's body, but in that case it was, in his case it was, and that's in the other guy with the migraine headache, it was also with the lung cancer it was. You know, so this is a real spiritual world. Some people are bound by many different things, but the thing behind it, the force behind it is a spirit manifesting itself as best it can in a person's life. So it's important we understand these things because if we don't, then we're limiting ourselves and what God can do in our lives. I want to close just by giving you the purpose of the gift. The, re, the gift of the discerning of spirits is to reveal the spirit, not just behind the operation, but also to demonstrate it. Now let's look at Acts 27, well, Acts 12 first, then 27. Acts 12, verses 7 through 10. Behold, the angel of the Lord came upon him, and a light shined in a prison, and he smote Peter on the side and raised him up, saying, Arise up quickly, and his chains fell off. From his hands. And the angel said unto him, Gird thyself and bind on thy sandals. And so he did, and he cast, or he, he saith unto to him, Cast thy garment about thee and follow me. And he went out and followed him, and wist not that it was true, which was done by the angel. But thought he saw a vision. When they were past the first and second war, they came into the iron gate, which leaded up to the city, which opened to them of his own accord, and they went out and passed on through one street. And forthwith the angel departed from him. Now, come on. You talk about an escort to escort you out of prison. And how about this? How about just the fact that he was concerned about him putting on your cloak? Put your coat on. And just stay warm. Let's get out of here. So the angel goes and brings him out of prison, talking to him, telling him what to do. And then the massive gate just opens on its own. That's called deliverance, the purpose of the gift, deliverance. And look at this one, chapter 27, and this is Paul on the ship. For there stood by me this night the angel of God, whose I am and whom I serve, saying, Fear not, Paul, thou must be brought before Caesar, and lo, God has given thee all them that sail with thee. Notice the, the information that he gives. The angel stood by me and told me, Paul, you're going to live. You're not going to die. And they're all going to live too. They got to stay in the boat and they'll live also. But there, here's a discerning of spirits. He sees the angel. The angel tells him, you can bank on what the angel said. So once again, there's revelation that's given and he's delivered and his life is spared. And then in Joshua chapter 5, and this is 13 to 16, here we have encouragement. It came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho that he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, there stood a man over against him with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went unto him and said unto him, Art thou for us or for our adversaries? And he said, Nay, but as the captain of the host of the Lord. Hallelujah. Am I now come? Joshua fell on his face to the earth and did worship and said unto him, What saith my Lord unto his servant? And the captain of the Lord's host said unto Joshua, 
Loose thy shoe from off thy foot, for the place whereon thou standest is holy. And Joshua did so. How about you facing something difficult like he was facing right now to go into Jericho and take over the city? And the captain of the host of the army of the living God pays you a visit and says, don't be concerned about this. Be encouraged. You're not going alone. You're not at this alone. And finally, Acts chapter 10, we have also guidance and direction. We could receive guidance this way. There was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a certurion of the band called the Italian band. I played an Italian band once. It wasn't like this, but it was an Italian band. A devout man and one that feared God. Notice the, notice the uh, qualifications. A devout man, number one, he feared God, number two, with all of his house, and gave much alms to the people. And prayed to God always. And he saw in a vision, evidently about the ninth hour of the day, an angel of God coming in to him and saying unto him, Cornelius. I mean, he looked up, he looked on him, he was afraid. I said, What is it, Lord? And he said unto him, Thy prayers and thy alms are come up before a memorial before God. And now send men to Joppa and call for one Simon. He's giving him direction, whose surname is Peter, who he lodges with uh, Simon at Tanner whose house is by the seaside, he shall tell thee what thou oughtest to do. And when the angel which spake unto Cornelius was departed, he called two of his servants, or two of his household servants, and a devout soldier of them, and th that waited on him continually. And when he had declared all these things unto them, he sent them to Joppa to do what he was told to do. So we have direction. So we have this manifestation of the Spirit that we can expect to happen in our lives. And and again, just, I just want to close with this. When I first came here 43 years, almost 43 years ago, in downtown Midland, you know, some young boy was probably in his 12-year-old, 11-year-old, 12-year-old, maybe early teens, something like that. His mother said, I'm going to take sure the pastor's parsonage is where he's staying. And he said, I think it's that one right over there, Mom. I said, why do you say that? He said, because I see those angels, those first four angels are just hovering over the house. Can you imagine that? Now, he, just a young boy sees this. And then even people that are non-believers can have that happen. There were those in, the, in downtown in the city that actually complained. People complained. They called the church and complained. How, how, how come your pastor has to have those two big bodyguards when he walks downtown? They said, what are you talking about? They're big bodyguards, and one's on one side, one's on the other side. Our pastor doesn't have bodyguards. No, they were, their eyes were open to see the spirit world and they saw them. You know, we're living in the last of the last days. We're going to have more manifestations like this than ever before. Let's stand together before the Lord. But the discerning of spirits is God giving us the opportunity to look beyond this realm and see in the spiritual world, the spiritual realm, spirits that are good, evil, Resurrected Christ, the risen Christ, similitude of God, and so on. Demon spirits, angels, angelic beings, and the list goes on and on. Now, how do we position ourselves for this? The more you pray in the spirit, the more you position yourself to experience spiritual manifestations. Amen? Amen. Praise God. You know, if you're viewing by live streaming or if you're here in house and maybe you've never been born again, You've never given your heart to Jesus. I can't even begin to imagine what the spirit of a man looks like without Christ. Can you imagine that? What the spirit of a man without Christ might look like. Would the, can you imagine if God would open up our eyes to see that, that spiritual condition? And then see some, that same person get born again. And then see what that masterpiece looks like. Because a child of God is this masterpiece. Hallelujah. If you haven't been born again, I'm not talking about playing church. I'm talking about giving Christ your heart to pass from death to life. You have a spirit. You are a spirit being, and it needs born again. If not, you'll be lost in eternity in the lake of fire, and you don't want any part of that. Sometimes we just do our best to preach the gospel, not to make people afraid of hell, but for people to reverence God and to know that, hell, that sin is such an awful thing that to remedy it, it took Christ to come to the earth and pay our sin debt. 
We should want Christ. We should be so appreciative for what he's done for us that we would run to him and lay our lives down before the throne of God. Just say, save me by your grace. So if you're here in house or by live streaming and you've never given your heart to Jesus, pray this prayer with me. If you really desire eternity with him and not a lake of fire with all Satan and his hosts, because that's the reality of it. Just say the simple prayer, Heavenly Father, I come to you just as I am. I believe with all my heart Jesus died for my sins and was raised from the dead for me. I open the door of my heart. I call upon the name of the Lord. Lord Jesus, come into my heart. I accept you. I receive you. I confess you as my Savior and my Lord. I deny myself to take up my cross and follow you all the days of my life. Heavenly Father, I have called on the only name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved, the name of Jesus. According to your word, I am now your child in Jesus' name. Amen. If you meant that, you're a child of God. If you could see your spirit pass from death to life, you'd be amazed as to what took place on the inside of you. You've got a joy unspeakable that's full of glory. You've got new life in Christ. You're a new creation. Old things have passed away. All things are brand new. You've got no slate of anything ever done wrong in your life. It's completely wiped out and remitted. Thank God for that. I encourage you to write down the date, the time, and the hour. That's your spiritual birthday. I encourage you to call the number on the screen. Let us know. We'll give you a Bible and some printed materials. I encourage you to get into a good Bible-based church where you can be taught God's Word, where you can grow in your Christian faith and experience, and also where you can give back to God by serving Him in any capacity with the gifts, the talents, and abilities that He has given you. Amen. So we rejoice with you. Heaven rejoices with you. We thank God for your life. And you've got a wonderful future ahead of you if you made Christ your Lord. Amen. Praise God. Father, now as we depart this evening, we go with joy unspeakable in us as well, full of glory. Knowing that we're your children, washed in the blood of the Lamb, heirs of God, joint heirs with Jesus, more than conquerors through Him that loves us, world overcomers by our faith. You've made us the head and not the tail, above only not beneath. You've blessed us coming in, going out in the city, in the field, the basket, the store. All that we set our hands to do will prosper, and no weapon formed against us will pro prosper because we belong to you. So as we go, Father, surround us with your favor, your presence, your angels, and also the blood of the Lamb to keep us the body protected and safe, bumper to bumper, side to side, everywhere in between. And Father, we just believe that everywhere we go, praise God, will be a blessing. Keep animals off the road. Give us a holy bonus to proclaim Jesus. And Father... As we let our light shine among men, they will see you and glorify you, our Father in heaven. We love you. We bless you. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You know what? As I went up to uh, camp yesterday to see the children that are at camp, on the way up there, just minding my own business on the turnpike, there was a man, a minivan. You see, we pray this all the time. There was a minivan that hit the embankment, went up, up in the air, and landed on its roof. And there were five people just sitting on, on the bank. Right, the, right at the embankment there. You never know what you avert when you pray. I'd rather know that I avert it rather than have to see it happen. What about you? So stay in faith and believe God. Amen? Have you got something? We'll sing this and be dismissed.